So oh, that's thank you for very coming very, very nice. on this rainy British weathery day. <laughs> and I'm so thrilled to have a book to share after many years of hard work. And I would like to begin by telling a little story. First of all, I would like to say that when Kitty, Kitty Davy had finished her autobiography, she received a letter from Ward Parks. And Ward had written very marvelous, you know, kudos and fabulous, uh, lovely things to say about Kitty's book. And she was so happy because she, you know, was very intensely happy that he was a professor and that he would, you know, like her book. And I happened to be the one on duty that day and I read the book, I read the um, letter from Ward about her book and she got so excited after I finished this complimentary letter and she said, oh, I must tell Lois who helped her edit the book. I must tell Rosie who helped place the photos in the book, it will be a real feather in their cup. <laughs> <laughs> so when my book arrived, I got a cup. Oh. 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 <laughs> and I put a feather in my cup. <laughs> so Lois and I will often say to each other when something goes right, it's, re it's a real feather in our cup. <laughs> The most important first thing to say is the thank you to Meher Baba for creating Kitty Davy and Elizabeth Patterson and Margaret Krask and all of us. And really, without Mayor Baba, none of this would have ever happened. So that's kind of the most important thing to really say. And what a fabulous dynamic trio these women were and how fortunate I was to be in their employee. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, let's see, where's Bob and, aha, uh -huh. Bob and Monica for helping with this wonderful cover. Don't you think it's bad? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The photo, isn't that, it just makes you want to go in. So that's Bob's photo of, he thinks between the going from Bob's house to. I think it's on the way to Bob's house. On the way to Bob's house. Lots of other people helped. Uh, Susan was so Susan White was so helpful with photos from Wynn that are in the book, and many many other people in the book. <coughs> and so that it was a real group effort, which I appreciated everybody's contributions. And I came to write the diaries because Lois was Lois Brager was working there. When I began to work there, she would tell me the silly kittyisms, and I would say, have you written them down? No, she hadn't written them down. So I started writing down the silly kittyisms, and then I began to realize I was there at this incredible time with Elizabeth Patterson, Kitty Davy, and Margaret Krask often coming, you know, for holidays. And thank goodness I began these diaries and kept them going through Kitty's passing in 91. So from the middle of 1979 through the end of 91, I kept diaries and I would just force myself, even if I was exhausted, to go home and write what I remembered. And I would, because I knew I was keeping diaries, I would work very hard to try to remember things that they, they would say. Some days I would keep notebooks and just write little messages to myself that would, I'd flesh them out later. And so then Lois retired and I said to her, let's do something about organizing it. We really, you know, a lot of the diaries were I, I came to work, I vacuumed the house, I made lunch, I took Kitty to the bank, I went home, you know. So this was the cream of the crop. You know, these, we really worked very hard to get the best entries into a book. And 
uh, I think what I'd love to do is just show you some photos that were from the book and talk as I go along. So, let's see, this is, okay. Mm. That was me when I was 32 <laughs> and Kitty was 89. And I remember dragging myself home after a day's work or coming in from teaching music and being so tired and Kitty would say, oh, looking at, me, at my bedraggled 30-some-year-old body, you know, like I was just exhausted and she was going a mile a minute and she'd say, oh, I never remembered being tired until I was 60 or 70. <laughs> Elizabeth Patterson was, it was just wonderful to spend more time with her because she really was behind the scenes and she really didn't, um, she was really shy in a way. She loved her animals, but she didn't come out to people the way Kitty would. And she told me once she was happy to be the administrator and she was glad that Kitty was there because Kitty was the people person and they were a good combo, as we all know. Uh, just reading a few of my entries, short little snippets about Elizabeth. Elizabeth, talk to me today about the term the nearby community. In the 1970s, as a group of Baba lovers living near the center grew, everyone used the term the off-center community. <laughs> she stated that this was not at all a complimentary phrase. I had never thought about it, but it truly did sound, it made us sound more cracked than we might possibly have been. Elizabeth had considered a few different word combinations and she shared them all with me. She liked her phrase, the nearby community. It has stuck ever since, saving us tough nuts to crack from being labeled completely off-center. <laughs> Elizabeth was such an incredible, poised person, and so aware. Elizabeth asked me to go with her to the center to get a guest's cabin ready. As we got out of the car and walked slowly to Cove 2, she asked, Do you see the weather vane on the roof? When I replied that I'd never noticed it before, she said emphatically, Yes. You must become more aware. Be, a care be careful to attention to details. I felt like Baba was really asking me to do this. I felt the power of her words go into me like it really was a training, like I was really in training by the avatar. I watched Elizabeth come up with numerous ways to make the cabin more comfortable. Uh, I remember once she we were going to the cove because she wanted to make sure there was a teapot that was not cracked because she knew that Darwin and Jean Shaw were coming in and Jean loved her tea in the morning and she didn't want a teapot that had a crack in it. Uh, another time she wanted me to get an extra pillow when Hilda Dale was coming into the lookout cabin because she knew, how did she know this, that Hilda was writing a book and that she liked to write propped up in bed with pillows and not at a desk. So these little, that you know, these people like would never know. The Shaws would never know that she had gone specially with a tea, for the teacup or that Hilda had gone especially for the, you know, to get the pillows. So that was a very touching part of my job was watching her attention to details. As I rushed about today, I recalled another typical Dilruba day recently. The phones were ringing off the hook, the doorbell was ringing, the meal was being prepared, Kitty and Elizabeth were calling me at the same time, and then I was asked to make a bed in the guest room for a visitor. As I ran into the room with the linens, Elizabeth came in and sat down on the other bed. She watched as I forgot to put on the top sheet. 
I exclaimed in exasperation as I had to rip off the bedsheet and begin again. I'll never forget her saying to me, with much love and wisdom, this is exactly what the spiritual life is all about, seeking poise in the midst of intense activity. Margaret Crass was another amazing woman, and I was so aware when my husband Tom and I were in London last fall, and he was sharing his stories, and I was sharing a few stories. I was saying how lucky we were in America that Baba gave us two English treasures, Elizabeth Patterson, I mean, uh, Kitty Davy and Margaret Crass, you know, just that they were the best of the best, and they were from England, and here they were in America for us to enjoy and to learn from. So I know it had nothing to, to do with them, but I was saying I was very thankful for all that British upbringing that they had that we partook of with great happiness. So here are some Margaret, some Margaret entries. One of Margaret's happiest memories that she shared today was about an elephant that danced for Baba at a circus near Aurangabad. Late that night as the circus ended, everything was being taken down. As Baba and the women were leaving, they came out into an open area and there was the elephant. Seeing Baba, it began performing its dance for the from the circus act. The elephant was doing its routine slowly and gracefully in the light of the full moon. Mm -hmm. Margaret's description was enchanting. Mm -hmm. Margaret was extremely helpful to me in my, in my own life and she must have been on some level aware that I was in conflict because when I started working there I had decided I was going to give it all up and stay there and be a gopi and work for Elizabeth and Kitty. I knew underneath that something wasn't 100%, I wasn't 100% happy just being there all the time and she must have picked up on that. So she had this amazing thing that she wanted to say to me. Let's see. That's I was seriously thinking, what does Baba want of me? When I went to Dilruba, Margaret came into the book room and started asking me what my aspirations were, what I wanted to do with my life. I had envisioned a life of Gopi-like devotion, helping Elizabeth and Kitty, remaining single, serving at Dilruba selflessly. But Margaret, after asking what I'd done before and finding out that I'd been teaching music and also singing, replied emphatically, this place is a nunnery. It's filled with old women. You don't belong in a nunnery. You are young and vital. Baba needs you out in the world doing what you're good at doing. And so she really had a long conversation with me trying to help me decide, did I want to do more singing? Did I want to do more teaching? And she spent a lot of time with me that day and it was tremendously helpful because I realized I was missing teaching music so I luckily was able to do both. You know, I would go out and teach and then I'd come back and work there when I could. So that was a great gift for Margaret. One of my favorite memories was driving her to programs. And one day she, um, she talked about love as we came back from a program. As we drove back to Dilruba, Margaret commented thoughtfully about, it was a talk by Rick Chapman, and so she said, she commented about Rick's contention that there were no special observations, observances with Baba. Love was the most important thing. Just loving him and others, longing for him more and more, that was the key. She remarked that all the intellectual Baba talk drove her mad. <laughs> 
I said that I supposed loving was really much harder to do than dry intellectualizing, which comes so much more easily. Margaret agreed and continued, we love him more and more because of Baba's incredible lovingness. That sweetness of his being continually overwhelms us. And we learn and unlearn through his active giving and constant compassion. Because he is love, we finally learn to love. Then she added, with Baba, he helps you love more and more. He gives you more and more so that you may love more and more as the years go by. That's what she had found. It became easier. That was so very comforting to me. I decided to this, was, this photo wasn't in my book, but I came across it and I realized that this photo of Kitty in 1952 at the center when Baba had just asked her to stay and take care of the center with Elizabeth brought up something as I put the diary together that was very powerful to me and very intense. I knew that Baba had asked Elizabeth to pick either Rano or Kitty to remain behind, and Bob and Elizabeth picked Kitty, and she stayed behind, obeying Baba. But you know, she wanted to be with Baba. Everybody that was with him wanted to remain with him always and be in his physical presence. And just somehow, I became more aware of how that must have been on a deeper level difficult for her, just, you know, she would never complain, but just not being in India and staying with him. After Katie Irani left, Kitty was disheartened. I think Katie's visit triggered feelings of the great upheaval in Kitty's life, Baba's departure in 1952, and his wish that she stay in the U.S. to help Elizabeth run the center. Of course, she had said yes and did this willingly for Baba, but she fervently longed to go back to India to be with him. When I was with her in the afternoon, she was on the verge of deep depression and was afraid that I'd leave. She kept saying, you'll stay with me, won't you? I happened to have my guitar and sang a few songs. I was so gratified that this music lifted her out of her sadness. That, that was more toward the end of Kitty's life, that entry. <laughs> Again, toward the end of Kitty's life, she would be in and out of this world. And one day I was on duty with Roz Hay, Roz Taubman, and she and I, <coughs> came to Dilruba to find out that Kitty had decided that she was going to New York. So we at first tried to dissuade her and thought, well, she's, Kitty, you know, we don't, we can't go to New York. I mean, she was bedridden by this point. But then she was so excited about going to New York that we finally said, Roz and I looked at each other and decided, let's go to New York, you know? So we sort of played that idea up <coughs> and when, when Kitty realized we were going to New York, she said, oh, I'll say, Kitty is more disoriented now and going in and out of confusion. When Roz and I were with her today, she exclaimed emphatically, I want to go to New York. We're going, aren't we? We couldn't dissuade her, so we played along and told her we were going with her. Kitty got very excited that we were all getting out of Dodge. <laughs> she leaned in toward us and confessed conspiratorially. Oh, how wonderful. I never did like Myrtle Beach that much anyway. <laughs> okay, so one of the, I guess, the fourth wheel in the house was Jimmy the Turtle. <laughs> and uh, so this is one of my favorite Jimmy the Turtle entries. 
feeding him ice cream was one of my <laughs> duties. <laughs> Putting him on the table that, you know, the porcelain tables that are now out on the back porch. Getting the vanilla ice cream out of the freezer. And he would open his beak, and because knowing that vanilla ice cream was coming, and you just shove this big spoon of vanilla ice cream into his mouth and hmm, ice cream. <laughs> After lunch, Kitty was resting on her bed, listening to classical music while reading Time magazine. Jimmy the turtle was nearby. When I came in, she put the magazine down inadvertently on top of him, then picked up the astonished turtle and exclaimed, oh yes, Jimmy loves music. Now you can hear the music, Jimmy. Then she put him up to her face so that his little beak-like jaw was kissing her cheek. She thought for a moment and then taking, oh, I said, Kitty, there are two music lovers in the house, you and Jimmy. She thought for a moment and then taking my statement completely seriously, she said, Yes, I suppose Elizabeth doesn't really like classical music all that much. <laughs> well, there's a lot of great Jimmy stories. Anyway, uh, I didn't realize as the summer of, of 1980 was rolling around and I was working there that Elizabeth was going downhill physically and closer to her end than we would have ever known. And so Elizabeth was, I think, tremendously, um, I think she was suffering a lot physically and she would get very upset. And those of us who worked there got smashed by her, you know, she would just be feeling badly, I think, and then she would, we would get the brunt of it. So I was being very, um, there was always something wrong with what the work was. And I got more and more upset and finally I thought, I don't want to work here anymore, but I just kept going and tried to swallow it. One day Margaret Crass came into the book room and said, you know, please don't take it personally. Elizabeth is not well and I think she's taking it out this way because you're the next, you know, warm body. And please don't take it personally. So I felt that really helped me out and yet at the same time I felt very upset after Elizabeth died and Kitty and I came back from the funeral and I came into the house with Kitty after Elizabeth's funeral and I was thinking as I saw this still photo of Baba planting the tree in 56 outside the barn I saw Elizabeth in the photo, it was, it was a still photo above the uh, fireplace. This very photo was there and Baba's hands gesturing, sending his love. As I looked at that photo and I had just come in with Kitty from the funeral, I thought, how am I gonna work here anymore? I'm still so upset at Elizabeth. You know, she was hammering me for months and I was so upset. And as I, looked at the photo and asked Baba, how am I going to get rid of this anger at Elizabeth? All at once I had this tremendous gift of an inner message from Baba and I heard him say inside, that was how I was giving you my love. Mm -hmm. oh. And as I heard that was how I was giving <coughs> you my love, instantly all of the anger totally disappeared and I just felt only fortunate and it was gone and never the anger never returned and I just have only feel thankful for all that she gave so that was that photo brings that story to mind often Kitty and I would take walks and this after a walk one spring day the postman came into the compound with some letters and there was a package, so he delivered it. We were sitting outside after the walk, and he was talking away, and Kitty was so animated and so excited, and after he left, she said to me, Oh, I've decided next lifetime I don't want to be a concert pianist. And I said, Oh, is that so? Well, what, what would you like to be, Kitty? She said, oh, I've decided I want to be a postman. <laughs> because postmen 
go around and they talk to people and they have such an interesting life with meeting so many people. <laughs> so that reminds me of the postman story. Kitty was always telling me to try to be, you know, she was always exhorting everybody to be more loving and more understanding. And this particular cat drove not just me crazy, but even Lois Brager and sometimes Barbara Katzenberg, who were cat lovers. So <laughs> one day she, she decided she had to talk to me about how I should love the cat more. <laughs> Because he was always meowing and getting underfoot and I'd be cooking a meal and he'd trip me up and I'd almost fall in the kitchen. So this is her explanation of why I should love the cat. <laughs> Kitty talked of the white and tortoiseshell cat. She knew I was annoyed at him as I kept putting him out. She said, well, no one likes him, but that's because no one understands him. He cries because he's hungry. Just put a little cat food down and he'll stop crying. He is a little dense. <laughs> That's true. I laughed and that made her add, yes, I think he's got a very low IQ, an IQ of eight. <laughs> and then she went on to say that, you know, he was fixed when he was young and he never had any fun. And <laughs> So I tried after that to love the cats more. <laughs> so there are many, many, many fabulous. Oh, yes. Okay. So we came upon uh, Kitty and I after Hur Hurricane Hugo came upon Dennis McCabe and, and uh, Malcolm Clay cutting trees that had fallen across the path. And so. At one point, Kitty looked over at Malcolm and she says, Oh, you must be Paul Bunyan. <laughs> <laughs> and so Malcolm said, Well, uh, if I'm Paul Bunyan, who is Dennis? And then Kitty said, Oh, I know. Dennis will be little Bunyan and you can be big Bunyan. <laughs> Evelina was the cook who we loved and, and she was kind of like a mother figure and she was very, very loving and she uh, worked there for so many years and we, the, um, Elizabeth called this group of us the Dill Rubettes. So uh, we gave her a birthday party one year, so that's at Evelina's birthday party at um, Jessalyn Hudson's house, who was the mom of um, Joy Miller. And Evelina told me something one day that was very touching. She said, just out of the blue as we were in the kitchen, she said, you know, I never told you this, but I think it was an anniversary of Elizabeth's passing. And she said, shortly after Elizabeth passed, she had a dream in which she saw a much younger Elizabeth Patterson running toward a man in a long white robe and falling into his arms. Mm. And I said, Evelina, that must have been Baba. And she said, oh, I, I never thought of that. I, I've never told that to anybody. So that was a very beautiful dream that she had. Uh -huh. Margaret, in the older years, she would go out and sit and we bundle her up and she would be taking a little kind of a, a snooze and she would be sitting out in the, in the compound there. So this is just a, a happy memory of one of those days when I brought her lunch out and then she sat. <laughs> such an amazing, such an amazing person, what can we say? Let's see, while Kitty was out to lunch with Bill Files, I rushed about like a crazy woman, sweeping, mopping, vacuuming, dusting. Margaret is visiting and I also prepared lunch. It was chilly but sunny. In the afternoon, she wanted to go outside, so she bundled up in Kitty's old maroon coat and a pink woolly hat. I took a quilt out to the chair near the garage, facing it toward the sun, and after she sat down, I wrapped the quilt around her. I told her she looked like she was on a cruise. <laughs> yes, she replied, I'm off on a cruise, a cruise to the sun. I'll send your love to him. 
<laughs> she was, uh, I think one of my happiest times with her, I have to tell you, is sometimes she would get very sort of uh, just playful and a couple of times she would just lean her head back in the kitchen when I was cooking. She'd come in and she'd just go, oh. <laughs> and she would howl, and then, you know, it was inspiring, so I would howl back, <laughs> and there's a few entries in which, you know, she would howl, and then I would howl, and she says, I think we must have known each other as wolves. <laughs> <laughs> this is Kitty at 98 at her birthday party, and, you know, everybody brightened up whenever Kitty was around, and that was, many of you remember these wonderful meetings when Kitty would be there. But, I mean, when you look at Kitty, she certainly doesn't look 98. <laughs> and this was, again, in the last years of her life with her maroon, her favorite old maroon coat that was kind of falling apart that she loved the best. Um, she had a sister, May, who had married and moved to Canada. May's daughters, Zilla and Jenny, are here. Uh, Zilla is on the left and Jenny's on the right and they would come through they would often go to Florida and stay and get out of the cold in the winter they came to visit Kitty because she was starting to fail and uh, they were just wonderful people and they helped me put together a lot of material for the, the chapter I put in the book about Kitty's early life because she was like a their auntie, of course, but like a second mother, because May would take them to England and they would stay with their wonderful aunt, Aunt Kitty. And then about an, a year and a half before Kitty passed, Hazel Davy, the older woman on the right in the first picture, and her daughter Lynn came after sending a letter that they were Davies and they had gone all the way to England to try to find more Davies and been told that there was a Davy on their own mm. con on this continent. Mm. So they came after Kitty wrote, a, I had a letter written back to them and they came and had a great time with Kitty. And you can see Lynn in the middle, you know, has, as they said, the Davy look. She has that sort of square face. Um, Hazel, the older woman, uh, married Kitty's father's brother's son. Kitty's uncle, Kitty's father's brother, came, went to the west to Vancouver, I think, and his son Leslie married uh, Hazel. And she wrote a big long history from Kitty's taping, taped uh, reminiscences, which are the basis of my Kitty's early life in, the, in this book. And they were wonderful. So you can see they came back again later. So you see Kitty older in this picture on the right. And Evelina had retired, but one day that I remember so well, Kitty's failing, and Evelina called and said, could she come see Kitty? And that was so touching. Because they just sat there, Evelina had been retired quite a while, they just sat there together holding hands on the front porch. And I looked at Evelina and she had, you know, her chin was kind of quivering and I could see she was silently weeping as she remembered the years of service and her love for Kitty. So this was in October and Kitty passed in December, so this is a few months before Kitty died at, at um, Halloween. Barbara and I dressed up as Kitty's kittens. By that time Kitty's head was sort of a little bent over, as some of you would remember. And this is, you know, Kitty wasn't able to walk after she had a, a strangulated hernia. Let's see, that was the end of January 1991. Then she was never able to walk again, and she died in December of that year. So she, different ones of us would take turns, two at a time, spending time with Kitty and helping and feeding her. And, but she, you know, she was suffering, but she just remained so cheerful which was a great gift to, for all of us to see. And uh, after Kitty died, 
I was sent a beautiful um, postcard from Mani. And on the other side of the postcard was written this message. Dearest Kathy, I loved your sunny card and letter, the little memories of our darling kitty, which made such a fragrant garland. I have chosen this card because this bird conveys Kitty's glorious freedom, soaring above illusion, flying straight into her beloved's arms. While her absence makes a hole in your lives, in time her love will make his wholeness fill it up more and more to overflowing. Much, much love to you all is dear, dear Kitty Kittens and beloved Baba's and Mara's love and a J. Baba hug, Monty. And that was the beginning of feeling like I wasn't going to just die from grief, just getting that message. And then, um, as I say in the book, I got, I had this incredible dream about 10 months after Kitty died in which she came to me. She was walking through a, um, into a kind of a, it must have been a European landscape because there was a big Brandenburg type or an Arc de Triomphe kind of an edifice. And she was walking into a field to the left of this huge arch, walking very rapidly, very young. We were following her. She turned, and Lois and I were at the front of the line. And as she turned to us, she looked straight at me and Lois, and she said, what have you, you've been working for me all these years. What have you done to utilize the training that I gave you? And she wasn't mad, she was very intense. It was intense. What have you done to utilize the training? So after I finished writing the diaries and editing them, I decided it would be important to, to add what the training was. So I have a chapter called Reflections, in which I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what were the main points of the training, and then Lois worked on it with me. I talked to Dana and Barbara. Dana Perry and Barbara Katzenberg and got some, you know, ideas or verifications from them. So that was important. And then, of course, there was this wonderful chapter of the um, Kitty's early life. So, this is Mama Helena Davy on the left and John. So you see where Kitty got her face from. Yeah. <laughs> He was the master of the Stationers Guild, which was a guild of printers, you know, sort of a medieval to mid guild of high quality printers. Helena was a pianist and uh, had all the children study instruments and play music together. So Kitty told me that there were 11 that her mother had 11 pregnancies, two were stillborn, three children died in infancy, and six lived to maturity. So you see Kitty is the furthest on the left, yeah. then Mama, Davy, and then Angela is the youngest, and May behind on the right. May was the, the woman who moved to uh, Canada. Okay, so Father Davy with Willie, Herbert is the youngest, and Ernest on the right. Willie died tragically in World War I. Her, we know about Herbert, and um, Ernest disappeared, and nobody knew what happened to Ernest. He was kind of the black sheep of the family, I, I was told. So Kitty is the second from the right with her hands folded on the desk. Uh -huh. Doesn't she look adorable? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> those are, and uh, Herbert hadn't been born yet, so those are the five, five of the six. Kitty as a teenager with May and Angela. Um, the mother had them had the girls study and not just sit around crocheting. And so Angela, for instance, on the right, became a um, a therapist helping deaf people 
using the latest technology in London at the time to help them be able to speak and uh, utilize the, the technology they had at that time to be able to be understood. And Kitty often, when we would see fancy British BBC productions on TV, she would talk about being presented at court. So there she is with her mother when she was 19. And there's a long entry about that. It's wonderful. Presented at court and a little bit later when she was in her early 20s on the right. Uh, these were photos I took when I went to Canada after Kitty died to get these photos and to get some history of Kitty. So there's Zilla in the, what would you call that? The bright, multi-pattern, multi-colored <laughs> blouse and Jenny. You know, it's, Zilla was not devoted to Baba, but Jenny was just, a, that's a whole another story. And there is Hazel in the middle. And there we are talking about Kitty with Hazel and her daughter Lynn. And if you ever go by the guest house compound, there, this tree is still there. <laughs> I decided it was such a beautiful photo, I wanted to use it opposite my dedication page. And uh, so in the last couple of months, I've gone by and there that wonderful lucky tree is still there. So I wanted to thank Baba for these wonderful years and thank you for thank you for this. And he, please feel free to continue munching because Kitty, one of the things she was very good at was inviting us all to go raid the refrigerator at Dilruba before we started work. <laughs> so there are lots of goodies. Are you signing them? Oh, yes. And then now, yes, I'd love to sign books if anybody would like to. I was, yes. So I, I think I'll prepare to the table in the back. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And what was your favorite lesson from her? We don't have to do it. Okay. My favorite moment. And your favorite lesson you said you have at least. Okay. Okay. Favorite moment. I didn't, yeah, I didn't mention this, okay, uh, but it's in the book. This was I was, one what's that? It was one year. No, thanks. I was, in the later years, I was putting myself down for something, or saying something self-denigratory, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but I was saying something about, oh, I couldn't do this, or I, hadn't been good at that or and all at once Kitty who was kind of almost snoozing came out of this um, fog and said there you go you're always saying you're always she didn't say put yourself down because that's not British I don't know what she you know you're always saying you're always what would she say? Self-deprecating? Self-deprecating? Yeah, I can't remember, but you're always saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can do anything. You're very talented, you're very... You know, she went on and on. And for some reason, you know, you're very... You could sing, you could... You know, I don't know what else well, she said. She said, you're very talented in many ways, but you just don't give yourself the... You don't, I don't know what, I can't really quite say it except that at the moment when she said that, it was so painful because I guess it hit on a nerve of, um, it was true. And that lack of self-confidence was being sort of exposed. Uh, so I really thought about it a lot after I left. I sort of sculpted out the work that day. But as time went by, I think that became this tremendous gift because I think Kitty was saying I could do anything I, I'm, I'm, you know I don't really feel like it's personal anymore of me 
I feel like it's true of all of us. We, any of us, all of us could do anything. Um, it, it's Baba's, because we have Baba, and if he wants us to do something, it will happen, you know? And so whenever I would feel self shy or lacking in confidence to stand up and present a program or to sing a song, or I would think, you can do anything, you know? And I felt like it was a great gift. So that was, I'd say, the answer to that question. Uh, I don't know. I, I think um, there was one there was one passage I didn't read, which I feel, for some reason, I think maybe this would be a good kitty. Let me see if I can find that. Um, I don't. This. Kitty had such a, there was such a luminousness about her, which I'm sure was what Baba was like and more. So this, this passage really is one of my favorite passages in the book that I would like to share before I finish. The daylight was waning. Kitty was lying in bed on her side. She had me sit in her chair by her dressing table as she began dictating a response to a friend in India. There was so much love radiating out of her as she lay there, tired, not feeling well, but her spirit was giving out so much love. I was overwhelmed by her concern for this friend and her expressive way of putting together a letter of support and spiritual affirmation. I felt high as a kite by the time we finished. By the time we finished. The band of afternoon light that had been falling on my notepad was rapidly disappearing, and by the end of the letter it was gone. But the light from Kitty's love surcharged the room with a different, more subtle light. After the letter was finished, she had to say, turn on the light, it's getting dark. I hadn't noticed. <laughs> Thank you.